Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this week's National Bleeding Disorders Foundation, formerly National Hemophilia Foundation, Wednesday webinar. My name is Fiona Robinson, and I am the series host. In today's webinar, we will learn about wearable neurostimulation to promote hemostasis in bleeding disorders. This webinar is being recorded and will be available to the community on the NBDF website shortly after the webinar. We encourage you to ask any questions you may have today. You can ask your question by using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen at any time during the webinar. We will monitor these questions and following our speaker's presentation, we will put your question to them. Today's webinar will be introduced by Terry Willey, Managing Director at Pathway to Cures. Our speakers today will be Dr. Chris Zura, Senior Director of Scientific Affairs at Spark Biomedical and Five Liters, and Dr. Navid Kodaparast, Chief Science Officer at the Spark Medical and Five Liters. I'd like to thank Dr. Zura and Kodaparast for joining us today, and I'll turn things over to Terry now to get us started. Thanks, Fiona. Um, I'm Terry Willey, Managing Director of the National Bleeding Disorders Foundation's Venture Philanthropy Fund called Pathway to Cures. Pathway to Cures is a new program at the NBDF, which was launched a little over a year ago to encourage emerging biotech and biomedical companies to apply their innovations to address unmet needs in the inheritable blood and bleeding disorders community. One of the ways we encourage their engagement is through early stage investment in applications of their technology for the benefit of our community. The speakers you'll hear from today represent one such company, Spark Biomedical and Five Leaders, and in particular, their Five Leaders affiliate, which is focused on promoting hemostasis through non-invasive neurostimulation. We are delighted to be supporters, investors, and partners in this effort. More specifically presenting today will be Spark Biomedical and Five Leaders, Dr. Chris Zura. He is their Senior Director for Science. Perhaps some of you met him at BDC last year. Chris is a molecular biologist who has been studying vagus nerve stimulation for the past 20 years, and he is credited with seminal discoveries in neural control of bleeding and inflammation. Chris has a track record of success in bringing science to patients through commercial channels and has served as Vice President of Scientific Affairs at the Feinstein Institute. The Feinstein Institute for Medical Research at Northwell Health in New York is an important partner in this endeavor as well. You'll also be hearing from Dr. Navid Koda Opera. Sorry, Navid, I'm gonna not pronounce that well, but I tried. Uh, he's our he's the chief scientific officer at Spark and Five Leaders, and he's also a co-founder of the company. Navid's PhD is in neurophysiology using vagus nerve stimulation to treat disease. And over the past five years, Navid has been lead principal investigator for multiple successful NIH funded studies. Navid is responsible for overseeing Spark's clinical initiatives and works to advance their technology into new potential indications like the ones you will hear about today. So without further ado, over to you, Chris and Navid. Thank you. Excellent, Terry. Thank you so much for that very kind introduction uh, and a broader thank you to the National Bleeding Source Foundation and to Pathway to Cures for hosting us today and for uh, helping us advance this technology toward the clinic. Uh, it's it's a project which we're very excited about, uh, and uh, we look forward to discussing with you today what our plans are, what our goals are. Uh, and where that will begin is a discussion of what we know about this pathway we call the neural tourniquet. Um, I'll describe kind of what that is, how that works, and then I'll turn it over to Naveed to talk about how we're bringing that uh, into clinical trials and the work that we have going on in the clinic today. Um, interesting. Okay, there we go. Um, so a little bit of background about us. So as, as Terry mentioned, we are, our parent company is Spark Biomedical. We currently have on market a device called the Sparrow Ascent, which is pictured here on the right. Uh, the Sparrow Ascent is a transcutaneous auricular neurostimulation device. Essentially applies electrical stimulation to specific nerves in and around the ear. And that device is cleared by the FDA to manage the symptoms of opioid withdrawal in adults. At Five Leaders, our subsidiary, uh, we partnered with, as, as Terry mentioned, uh, Northwell Health and the Feinstein Institute, my former institute, uh, where I spent two decades studying these pathways. 
Um, and together, we're, through Five Leaders, we're commercializing this neural tourniquet pathway. Uh, and we're most interested in how that might be leveraged to uh, provide therapy to uh, people with bleeding disorders, uh, either genetic or acquired. Uh, but there are also potential applications in surgery and trauma, both civilian and military. We'll get into that a little bit uh, later. Uh, but first, in order to really understand what we're talking about, I'd like to take a step back and either provide you with a refresher of neuroanatomy or perhaps provide you with uh, some information about neuroanatomy you didn't know before. We're going to be talking largely about a nerve called the vagus nerve. And vagus nerve means wandering in Latin. And it's called that because it takes this wandering path from the brainstem down the neck, through the chest, and into the abdomen. And it innervates or touches all of the major organs uh, in the body. For the most part, what the vagus nerve is doing is collecting information from your organs about what they're doing and how well they're working and sending that, that information up to the brain. All that information is collected at a subconscious level, so you're not necessarily aware of that, especially under normal conditions. Uh, but the vagus is sending information about things like heart rate, blood pressure, respiratory rate, even blood oxygen levels, blood glucose levels, sugar levels. Um, and your brain is processing all that information and sending control signals back out through various means. Again, most of that is subconscious, but if something really gets out of whack, your brain knows about it. For example, blood sugar gets low, you begin to feel hungry. That's because your brain is sensing the low blood sugar levels. The other thing that we discovered that the vagus nerve does, and this was back in the late 90s, is that the vagus nerve can carry information about what the immune system is doing or about invading pathogens uh, being present. And those signals go up to the brain. And if there's just a couple of pathogens around or a little bit of immune system activity around, you don't necessarily know it. But if you really get sick, that information goes up into higher levels in your brain. And that's when you get a fever, you lose your appetite, you feel sleepy. So you begin to know that you have an infection because of those changes in behavior. And all that information is going up to the brain via the vagus nerve. What we had discovered in the late 90s was that the brain also responds not just with these behavioral changes, but with change, but it also changes signaling back down the vagus nerve into the spleen, where that signal will tell immune cells to behave differently. So under normal conditions, you're not sick. Your immune cells are just kind of what we call quiescent. They're quiet. They're circulating around your, the, the bloodstream. These are white blood cells. Um, and they're not doing much of anything. They're just on hold. They're waiting. If they detect a pathogen, the first thing they do is they call in the cavalry. They release these little molecules called cytokines, and they, be, they go into attack mode, and they try to, to clear the pathogen. Once the pathogen is cleared, those same cells then are supposed to convert into, a, into an activity where they are healing tissue. So not inflammatory anymore, but a, a healing uh, pathway, healing activities. Um, and that's that switch is controlled by the brain via the vagus nerve. Um, and so we began to ask the question, well, if the vagus nerve, the brain via the vagus nerve can control or change the behavior of white blood cells, what else might it do? So in 2000, we, pro we partnered with the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, DARPA, it's a division of the Department of Defense. Um, and we began looking at other activities that the vagus nerve is involved in. It led to this discovery of what we've come to call the neural tourniquet. And it turns out that the vagus nerve can change platelet behavior the way it changes immune cell behavior. Um, and that is what we are currently working through five leaders to bring to uh, into clinical trials and hopefully uh, into, into the marketplace. So at a high level, what does this mean? If with that vagus nerve, what we were doing was applying electrical, electrical stimulation directly to the vagus nerve in the neck. We discovered not only is that control inflammation, but it also reduces blood loss. Um, by close to 50%, by about 45% in mice and rats and pigs with intact hemostatic systems. So these are not hemophilia uh, animals in any way. They're, they have normal uh, and intact hemostatic systems. And we determined that as little as one or two minutes of, of vagus nerve st stimulation can significantly reduce the amount of blood loss. You can see that in the beakers on the right. Uh, you don't need to do statistics on that to know there's a big difference there. Um, and 
that's effective within five minutes and it lasts for about 24 to 48 hours. So there's a prolonged uh, window of efficacy after applying stimulation, uh, implying that it protects for, for a period of time. We went on to show that this was a platelet-driven activity, this, this reduced blood loss. Um, and it, importantly, especially for uh, this conversation today, it's independent of factor eight, which is the main uh, deficiency in hemophilia A. I'll, we'll talk a little bit to those data, but we'll keep that hopefully rather brief. Um, so here's some of our blood loss data, both from pigs and from mice. In both of these uh, experiments, these animals were fully anesthetized and subjected to soft tissue injury in the pigs. We uh, amputated part of the ear, partial ear resection. And in mice, we did a partial tail resection. Um, across the top two panels here, we're looking at the amount of blood lost from the wound, and we see significant reductions in blood loss in those animals that received vagus nerve stimulation, or VNS as it's labeled here, uh, compared with animals that did not get vagus nerve stimulation. Um, in the bottom left, we're also we're looking at bleeding time in mice, so how long those, those mice bleed following the, that injury, and we see about a 50% reduction in bleeding time. Um, and we also saw a similar reduction in bleeding time uh, in the pigs as well. Why not? There we go. Um, as I mentioned, we went on to demonstrate that this is a platelet effect. Um, so, and this is a kind of a complicated experiment, it's an old fashioned immunology experiment. Uh, and what we, what we did here is we took a collection of mice, half of them we gave vagus nerve stimulation. The other half, we did not. We gave them sham stimulation. We collected platelets from those mice and then put those platelets in other mice. And it was those other mice that got uh, the, the, the tail resection or the tail amputation. And what we see is that mice that get platelets from mice that got vagus nerve stimulation are significantly protected from blood loss, bleeding time here, um, as compared with those animals that got platelets from sham stimulated animals. So something about the platelets is carried over from the animals that got the stimulation to the animals that got the stimulated platelets uh, and it reduces their blood loss. Uh, and just to give you a picture of where this is actually happening, what we're looking at here is a picture of the spleen on the left. Uh, and we zoom in on that tiny little square uh, that's blown up on the right here in, in, uh, in the right panel. And in this sea of blue, which are just random cells in the spleen, you will see that one pink cell right in the middle. That's a very specific kind of T cell that is picking up that vagus nerve signal that we put in when we stimulate electrically in the, in the neck. And it conveys that signal via uh, a neurotransmitter called acetylcholine to platelets, which are those little green blobs that are right up against it. Um, and that's physically where the signal is being handed off from the T cell to the platelet in the spleen. So just to zoom back out, and then I'll turn this over to Naveed, uh, what we find is that neurostimulation, vagus nerve stimulation, as we've done in the preclinical settings, uh, sends this signal down to the spleen, where it's picked up by those specific T cells that then release acetylcholine. That acetylcholine binds to a specific receptor on platelets, which causes an influx of calcium into those platelets and what we call primes those platelets. Those prime platelets are more sensitive to triggers to coagulate. Um, we have learned a little bit about kind of how we look at those platelets and what specifically changes on the surface of those platelets, things like P-selectin, uh, one of the biomarkers that goes up on the surface of those platelets. Those platelets are capable of contributing to greater thrombin generation in the wound site. I didn't show you those data either, but uh, we've, we've looked at how thrombin is generated in the wound and in the shed blood. Um, and all of that comes together to decrease the amount of blood lost from that wound. But importantly, all that is happening without systemic clotting changes or changes in global coagulation measures. Um, we don't see changes in blood cell counts, nor do we see changes in cardiovascular measures like heart rate and blood pressure. Um, so it's something specifically about the platelets act in the, in the wound site, not systemically, uh, that's causing this reduction in blood loss. So with that, I'd like to turn this over to Naveed so we can talk about where we're going with this in the clinic. 
<clears throat> Thank you so much, Chris. Um, can everybody hear me? Chris, can you hear me? Thumbs up if you can. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. I'm really excited to be here today. And I, again, I want to thank the National Big Disorders Foundation and <clears throat> Pathway Secures for inviting us. Um, I'm really excited to share with you uh, what Five Leaders has been working on so hard over the last year plus uh, in terms of its clinical initiatives. And so if I can move to the next slide. Oh, sorry, that's me. Yeah. Oh, thank you, Chris. So as Chris really uh, did a great job describing of how the neural tourniquet got started literally almost two decades ago, this idea was really culminated from the idea of stimulating the vagus nerve in the neck, as he kind of described. Um, but I want to show you guys something a little bit uh, kind of from a broader scope. If you think about just various different neurostimulation strategies to modulate spleen function. And so the first topic here you can see is cervical vagus nerve stimulation, which Chris described in animals uh, in preclinical trials. But importantly, the cervical vagus nerve has, is, has, has an FDA approval for actually multiple indications. Well, it started with epilepsy, and then it transversed into depression. Um, and then just recently, it was approved for uh, patients that are undergoing uh, ischemic strokes or wanting to get, regain motor function following a stroke. And so you can see that this is one of the strategies that has been proven to be able to modulate spleen activity. And the second way of uh, modulating the spleen uh, is by, if you just follow the vagus nerve and you look at the distal branches off of it, you can see that one of those branches is the splenic nerve. And so the splenic nerve obviously innervates the spleen. Um, and so you can put a very similar cuff electrode directly right on the splenic nerve, deliver mild electrical stimulation, and then that will then uh, modulate spleen function. So both of these I would consider as invasive approaches, meaning that they require a surgical implantation of a medical device um, that will then become part of that body uh, for a number of years, if not forever. Um, there are some other non-invasive approaches that have been uh, studied and under research. And you can see here, uh, number three is focal ultrasound stimulation. Um, and so this is a way of delivering essentially ultrasound that will then modulate uh, the spleen function from, from the exterior. So essentially, this is not an implanted device. This is something that you can place just like you would uh, when you go to a gynecologist. There's a little bit different use in terms of focal, um, but it can actually modulate spleen function. The last one, which I'm going to be focusing on today, as you can see, the circle that highlights is auricular stimulation, auricular neurostimulation. And so if you can go to the next slide, please. You can see that the oracle is a highly innervated part of your body. Uh, there's actually multiple nerve types that are covering the oracle, that are sending signals, receiving sensory signals, and then sending those signals directly to your brain. Um, and so two of the nerves that I really want to focus on today are the auricular branch of the vagus nerve, and so as Chris described in his talk very well, you have two vagus nerves in your neck that actually line up right next to your carotid artery. And both of those vagus nerves can send a, they have a projection that goes to your ear. And so you can see these nerve fiber types in, in green that are essentially innervating the area, kind of like your inner ear, not inside your ear canal, but just outside your ear canal in an area called the Simba Concha and also an area called the tragus, which is kind of that cartilaginous flap right in front of your ear uh, next to your sideburn. The other nerve that I wanna highlight is in red, and you can see that it's kind of innervating in front of your ear and then kind of the portion on top of your ear. And this nerve type is called the auricular temporal nerve, and it's also a branch of your trigeminal nerve. And why these two nerves are very important is for the fact that the vagus nerve and the trigeminal nerve are both cranial nerves. So we only have 12 cranial nerves in our body. And uh, it's really important that when you think about the innervation to the brain, activating these cranial nerves are a really good highway network in terms of getting its way into the brain and sending a signal to change the brain function um, and going forward. So when you look at the figure on the right, you can actually see uh, that you have a vagus nerve. And as Chris and, and my previous slide also shows that the vagus nerve will send a signal to your spleen. But if you look as well, the auricular branches of the vagus nerve also send a, a signal to the brainstem. 
And so you have signals that can then go up into the brain, which you call as ascending pathways, but you also have signals that can go down the spinal cord or down the vagus nerve um, that can modulate certain organs, in this case of interest, the spleen. So if you go to the next slide, I just wanted to highlight very quickly here that auricular neurostimulation is a highly researched uh, field, uh, but also there's several industry partners. Uh, there are other companies out there that have developed technology uh, as a way to activate these nerve structures, um, and they all kind of have a little bit different flavor to them. And so if you look at the first figure on the left, you can see this is called a tragus clip device. Uh, these devices essentially, it's, it is what it sounds like. It's a clip electrode. Essentially, you clip it onto the tragus, which is, again, that cartilaginous flap in front of your ear. It delivers very mild stimulation to the tragus nerve, and it's a way of activating, excuse me, the, the vagus nerve. Um, the picture in the middle, you can see, is a what's called a percutaneous uh, neurostimulation device. These devices have uh, needle electrodes. So think of like an electroacupuncture type device. Um, they're more for like precise, if you wanna target a specific nerve type. Um, and so you place the needle electrode next to that nerve and it will deliver stimulation to activate that nerve. These systems uh, in, some, in some ways, they require a little bit more hands-on hold uh, or, or hand holding, and the fact that you do need a medical professional or healthcare provider to be able to administer this type of treatment. Uh, so it's not something that a lot of patients would be able to do on, by themselves at home. The third type of device on the right, you can see is a transcutaneous neurostimulation device. Uh, and this is the device that Spark by a medical created uh, the, Sparrow, the, uh, the Sparrow Ascent. And this type of technology allows you to deliver stimulation through hydrogels. So again, a hydrogel, think of like an ECG pad that you place on your chest. Uh, instead of recording electrical activity, this earpiece would deliver very mild electricity through the skin and activating the nerve types below. Please go to the next slide. Thank you, Chris. And so here is the Sparrow Ascent Therapy System that Spark has created. And essentially, it's, it, if you look at on the left, you can see the device in its entirety. It has three different components to it. It has a patient controller, which is the controller there with the screen on it, and it has a, a few different buttons. The buttons allow the patient to turn on the device and then and, and change their treatment intensity. So if they wanna increase the stimulation intensity, they can do so. If they wanna turn it down, they can. They can set a timer. If they wanna deliver only a certain amount of stimulation, it really gives them kind of a full autonomy in terms of their treatment. Um, it has a cable that connects the controller to the earpiece. And the earpiece is really kind of where the special sauce is. Uh, and when I say that, it means this is a disposable earpiece. Uh, it, and it allows you to wear the device for a minute or up to 24 hours a day. Uh, so again, kind of giving the flexibility to the patient in terms of their treatment options. But the earpiece does have three hydrogel electrodes. And so if you look at uh, the individual on the right, you can see where those, those hydrogel electrodes are targeting. So again, region one, which is the Simba Concha, is the area right above your ear canal. Uh, this is again where the auricular branch of the vagus nerve resides. And we put an electrode right over that to be able to modulate that nerve. Region two is right in front of your ear uh, called the auricular temporal nerve. And then region three is essentially an electrode that is what we call a return electrode. It allows you to do biphasic neurostimulation, which is considered uh, one of the safest forms of neurostimulation for patients. Uh, and I do wanna highlight uh, real quick that that is an FDA cleared system and it's for patients with opioid withdrawal, adults with opioid withdrawal. Uh, that is what Spark uh, uh, was able to get that indication for. But for today, uh, if you go to the next slide, Five Leaders has essentially adopted this technology from Spark uh, with the mission to determine if transcutaneous auricular neurostimulation uh, would be a uh, efficacious treatment for patients that have hemostatic issues or a way to promote hemostasis. So the idea is in question is, not only can we translate the work that Chris and his colleagues have done for nearly two decades uh, into the human, uh, but also the question is, can we do this non-invasively? Can we do this in a way that's safe and can be adoptable for a wide uh, gamut of patients? And so 
What I'm going to end on today is really talking through two different clinical trials that are already ongoing. Um, and so, again, the, the first question that we wanted to ask at Five Leaders is, can we deliver wearable nerve stimulation, auricular nerve stimulation, and regulate the platelet activity? And so we partnered with, uh, as, as Terry Willie mentioned at the beginning, uh, one of our partners is Northwell Health and specifically the Feinstein Institute. And so we have partnered with the Feinstein Institute to be able to conduct this study. And, and you can see two of the investigators listed below, uh, Dr. Lionel Blanc and Dr. Jared Houston. Lionel is essentially a, uh, a PhD with, uh, that focuses on blood disorders. And Dr. Jared Houston is a trauma surgeon that also co-founded the Neural Tourniquet with Chris. And so they have been fantastic collaborators to work with. And specifically on this study, we're focusing on healthy adults. And the idea is to determine, uh, look at blood biomarkers and determine if these blood biomarkers are modulated in a way that then can promote hemostasis. And so the study is quite simple. It is a randomized control trial. It has roughly about 30 subjects that will go through it. And they're, and they're uh, randomized into two different groups. One is where it's just delivering vagus nerve stimulation alone, which is called TAVNS. Um, and then the second group is TAN, where we're delivering vagus nerve and trigeminal nerve stimulation. And we're really wanting to determine which of these two could be a superior treatment option for patients. And so there are multiple different blood draws that are occurring over essentially uh, 200 minutes of the study. Uh, we do blood draws intravenously, and then we also do fingertip lancets, uh, looking at different endpoints. And some of the endpoints that we look at uh, are considered are for thrombin, such as uh, tissue antithrombin complex that we detect from the shed blood. And we also look at it in the systemic blood as well. Um, and then we're looking at some clinical endpoints, specifically thromboelastography or TEG. Uh, we're looking at fax analysis, which really allows us to look at the platelet and look at specific marker, markers that are being expressed on the platelet. Uh, PT, PTT, uh, and then looking at cytokine and some of the systemic inflammatory markers that can be modulated via vagus nerve stimulation. The last study I'm going to be sharing with you and also is an ongoing clinical trial uh, is in a patient population that suffers from von Willebrand's disease type one, and they have co-occurring heavy menstrual bleeding, heavy menstrual bleeding as well. Um, as many of you know, uh, BWD is the most prevalent bleeding disorder in the world. Uh, and Unfortunately, 80% of the women that suffer from VWD type 1 uh, have heavy menstrual bleeding. This is a very debilitating disorder for them, especially in their adolescent to teenage and young adult years, and it can span into later years in their adult life, uh, causing mental health challenges, obviously, uh, and also even just serious health challenges to these, to these individuals. And so this is a big, a big focus of five leaders um, because we, we really do believe that our technology can provide a treatment option for these patients. And so we've been fortunate to be uh, partnering with Dr. Angela Wayan. Uh, she's a hematologist at uh, University of Michigan, and she's just been a great partner and mentor uh, for us as we've been kind of developing out our clinical pipeline. Uh, but this study, uh, is ongoing, as I stated, and it's in women with VWD and HMB. And the overall goal is to show that we can reduce blood loss uh, through, through menstruation reduction. And so we have been, we're using a tool called uh, the PBAC, uh, which many of you may know. Uh, it's a, essentially a pictorogram that allows patients to look, to um, essentially line up what their menstruation looks like and how many pads or products they're using through their menstruation and as a way for us to estimate uh, blood loss. And so the study design is quite simple. This is an open label pilot trial. So essentially 10 subjects will be entered to the study and everybody receives the same treatment. And we have essentially a baseline phase where there is no stimulation that is delivered. Uh, the individual will go through their first menstruational cycle, uh, will collect PBAC scores, will also collect uh, scale scores regarding dysmenorrhea or menstruation cramping pain. Uh, and also quality of life within that first phase. After they complete their first menstruation, uh, the patients will then, uh, when they 
when they uh, go through their second menstruation, this is where the device is being administered. So for every day during their menstrual cycle, the patient will receive essentially 30 minutes of neurostimulation a day uh, until they complete their cycle. Uh, and then essentially we would make a comparison of the baseline menstruational blood loss versus the treatment menstruational blood loss. Um, and so we're really hoping to gain a lot of in, uh, intelligence from this in the sense that if it works and we show efficacy and safety for these individuals, we would then expand this into a larger clinical trial called a pivotal study, which would allow us to take that data and submit it to the FDA and hopefully get this product on market for patients suffering from VWD and HMB. If you go to the next slide, uh, I do have a call to action uh, for everyone on here. Uh, please, if you do know someone that is suffering from VWD and HMB, whether that is yourself or a family member or a friend, um, and you think they would be interested in this clinical trial, it'd be really amazing if they could go to our website. I believe it's posted in the chat and here on my slide. Um, they have, we have a very brief questionnaire that would determine whether they could qualify. Uh, and if they do, uh, it could be a very uh, good treatment uh, option for them in, in the study. So that's all I have for today. Um, and I want to thank everyone uh, for uh, inviting us and hosting this webinar. So again, thank you so much, Terry Willey and Renee Peck. Uh, you've been amazing partners along the way. Pathway Secure has been such a uh, instrumental partner for us. Um, and I would like to open it up for any questions. Super. Thank you very much, Dr. Zura and Godaparas. That really interesting presentation. Um, so interesting to learn so much about the vagus nerve and, and its stimulation and the potential that this holds for the, the bleeding disorders community. Just before we dive into our Q&A, I'd like to draw our audience's attention to the chat where we have dropped a few links during the presentation. Uh, the first link you see in there is to the Pathway to Cures program, if you'd like to learn more about that. And then we've got a link to the Spark Biomedical site where you can learn more about Spark and 5 liters. And then finally, we just popped in a link to 5liters.com uh, where you can learn more specifically about that VWD clinical trial and uh, potential to participate or perhaps refer somebody you know. So maybe take a moment, look in the chat, grab those links and save them somewhere so that you can check them out after the webinar. So we will now go ahead with our live Q&A. Um, and joining us for the Q&A, we have Terry Willey, Managing Director at Pathway to Cures. So if you have any questions for Terry or Dr. Zora or Kadaparast, please pop them into the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen, and we'll do our best to answer all of your questions. Uh, we do have a question that someone has put into our uh, Q&A box down here. So I'm just going to read this to you. Um, they pointed out that the vagus is a parasympathetic nerve. And so they're asking, does stimulation in the cervical region cause slowing of the heart rate? Does one of the methods used to slow down the heart rate in people who have a tendency for increased heart rate? And they've given examples of ST and SVT. So the, they commend you that this is a really interesting uh, concept, but they were wondering about this. Maybe you want to take that? Sh sure, yeah. Th I think that's a great quite a question from the audience. Um, and so... Vagus nerve stimulation, as I mentioned, has been around for almost uh, for 40 years, if not 50 years now. And some of the technology that's been FDA approved uh, has been around since the mid 90s. Um, and if you and the audience member definitely is on point in regards to how vagus nerve stimulation can affect autonomics by specifically driving parasympathetic activity. Um, and so what you do typically see when you deliver either auricular uh neurostimulation or vagus nerve stimulation is you see a transient change in HRV, which is heart rate variability. Um, and so you'll see typically a increase in HRV, which again is indicating increase in parasympathetic tone. Um, in some patients, they may see a, a decrease in heart rate, but again, it's transient um, and it, it typically goes back to sinus or baseline uh, rhythm. So it's it's really not something that uh, has been a safety concern uh, for patients that are receiving VNS uh, and also the same for auricular. 
And, and even at Spark Biomedical, a lot of our clinical trials, we put on essentially polar devices, which is kind of like a chest strap, and we've monitored heart rate activity uh, as patients go through uh, different types of addiction rehab. Uh, and so we really haven't seen any safety adverse events related to cardiac. But that's a great question. Great. Thank you very much for that. Um, we have a, a really very practical question. Um, this device, when you're wearing it, how does it feel? And, and when you do the stimulation, how does that feel? Does it hurt? Chris, you want to take that one? <laughs> uh, sure. Um, it, you do feel it. Um, it is not a painful experience. And in fact, our instructions for use on the opioid withdrawal, uh, opioid so, uh, symptom side, uh, stipulate, uh, describe that if it becomes painful, the, the, the user with that patient controller can reduce the amount of stimulation being applied to a threshold below painful, um, does not need to be painful. You do need to feel it. That nerve is a sensory nerve. Uh, and so kind of by definition, you will feel it, um, but it does not need, to, it is, it should not be painful. Um, and it is, um, it's almost like a tingling feeling. It's like what you might imagine as a, an electrical stimulation would feel. Okay. And does the person wear it long-term or do they just put it on for the duration of the stimulation and then remove it? I'll let, I'll take, let you take that. Abid. Yeah, sure. I, I think it depends on the indication. And so, mm -hmm. so for patients that are experiencing opioid withdrawal, this can be several hours, if not days, sometimes weeks. Mm -hmm. uh, and so patients that are using it for that indication, they actually wear it for many hours a day. Um, one thing I do want to note in terms of the safety and, and pain is we the same technology is being used in babies currently right now. Uh, we have uh, a clinical trial that's for the FDA for babies that are suffering from neonatal opioid withdrawal. And we deliver, it's the exact same waveform, uh, and we deliver it on infants. And so it is it is not painful. It's very comforting uh, if it's set to the right intensity, and that depends on the individual. Um, and they can wear it for, yeah, again, for a few minutes. Uh, or many hours a day. Um, for our blood studies, we're focused on delivering stimulation for roughly about 30 minutes, maybe an hour a day. Uh, and that's kind of what we think would be enough to promote the, hemosta the hemostasis needed to help with blood loss. So for example, if this was for heavy menstrual bleeding, is this something that I would wear and then I would use it when I felt like I needed it? Or is it more sort of a, a set protocol where daily at this time, it's used for this amount of time. And then you sort of, because the, you know, your period is not a day long thing, right? It's a five or longer day thing. Right. Yeah. I think we, we believe that again, stemming from the animal work, the preclinical studies where they delivered just a few minutes of stimulation a day and saw that the effect on the platelet lasted for 24 to 48 hours. Uh, we believe that just a short amount of stimulation, again, 30 minutes, maybe an hour of stimulation a day would have a carryover effect where it could then cover the patient. They may need to deliver stimulation the next day and then the next day. So again, as the study is designed for the BWD patients, we're delivering it just one session of 30 minutes every day during the course of menstruation. Right. And as you design these studies, is this something, are you talking to people with heavy menstrual bleeding and having their input in the design or how do you, how do you do that? Yes, very much so. Uh, you know, again, National Bleeding Disorders Foundation has been instrumental in helping us understand this population. Uh, we've partnered with several hematologists that take care of these patients, other foundation that uh, deal with uh, Women, women's health, uh, specific to blood disorders, we've been connected with one called VWD Connect. Um, and yeah, so we've we've really been out in the field trying to gather as much information about this, this patient and this disease that can then help hone in our clinical trial to ensure that it's gonna be effective and also practical for these patients. And I think you mentioned that one of the outcomes you're interested in is the quality of life. How are you measuring quality of life? Chris, you want that one? Sure. Yeah, so they, there are a number of different uh, validated instruments that we are using to monitor quality of life. There's a menorrhage impact questionnaire. There's a dysmenorrhea uh, symptom severity scale uh, that we're looking at. Um, so there are se several of those validated tools that we're using, uh, both in the pilot and that we intend to use in the pivotal that Naveed described. 
Right. Excellent. Now, how many um, patients were you looking to recruit for the VWD study? Do you have a, a number that you're aiming for? Currently, we're looking for a total of 10 in our pilot study. Um, we And those 10, the results we get from those 10 will tell us how many we think we'll need for the pivotal. So we don't yet have the number for the bigger trial yet. So it's really exciting technology and really interesting. And, and the idea of this impact, um, the potential impact for bleeding is, is just amazing. Are you looking at other bleeding disorders? I mean, I know you mentioned specifically the VWD. I don't know if you mentioned any others. I mean, theoretically, it could it could be really interesting for a number of disorders. Yeah, so we, we're definitely expanding it. Um, we have the like the two studies that I outlined today. We have another two studies, uh, one, the, one of them that is uh, kind of at an interim point. So we've done some analysis on the data. This is for a patient population that has acquired platelet disorder and they're undergoing a dialysis uh, port placement procedure. Uh, this is being done in, in Georgia at Piedmont Health Hospital. Um, and then another study that will be starting later this uh this winter, hopefully not too much into the spring, uh, but it's a study at UT Southwestern um, looking at patients that are undergoing a lumbar spine uh, fusion procedure. Uh, and so we're looking at how the technology can help with reduction of blood loss uh, during the surgery and postoperatively, but also looking at even some pain metrics to see if it can help with overall pain following that procedure. Uh, so we do see uh, a lot of channels kind of leading towards surgery uh, outside of the blood disorder space. And so we're really kind of putting feelers, if not pilot clinical trials together to kind of understand where the technology has a good fit, but also understand where it may not work. Uh, and so, yeah, we have a fairly large clinical pipeline that we're developing. But within the bleeding disorders, it's really the the platelet disorder that you mentioned and the VWD, those are sort of your main folks, foci for the moment. At the moment, yes. Interesting. Um, another question that someone has brought, an interesting um, point that they make is that it's similar to, or it appears to be similar to an, an e-stim for back pain. Um, I, I don't know if you'd like to, to comment on that comparison. And, and they're asking then, you know, how would this compare in terms of cost? If this was something that was a feasible um, treatment for excessive bleeding, how would the, that compare in cost to the, the costs of current treatments for excessive bleeding? Yeah, great questions. Um, in terms of the back device for pain, yeah, those are typically called TENS devices, uh, tr a transcutaneous erectile neurostimulation device. Uh, and they're quite different. So TENS devices are really for focal pain and so if you have back pain, you put it on your back. If you have knee pain, you apply the current to your knee. Um, the differences in the technology is the fact that uh, what we're doing with auricular neurostimulation is targeting cranial nerves. Um, and so the effect is not local. It's being processed centrally in the brain, which would then send the signal to either the target organ, in this case, the spleen, um, and so we don't believe that a TENS device would have a similar effect as an auricular neurostimulation device. The pathways are not there to, to make that conclusion. Um, regarding a, the feasibility and the cost, uh, you know, as we all know, the, the patient, patients that are suffering from blood disorders, it's, it's exp very expensive treatments for them. Uh, some, some of these pharmacologics can be uh, very costly. Uh, from our standpoint, we're looking at developing a technology that can be feasible uh, and that will not be uh, a cost burden for our patients. Uh, we don't know exactly what that would be right now until we get into that market, but that's currently under research by our financial teams. And maybe one of the things that they were getting at with the comparison was, I don't know how much a, a, a stimulation for back pain device costs, but I'm guessing it's not as much as replacement factor. Um, so I guess maybe they're thinking it, it, it looks like something that could be relatively affordable. Yeah, that is that is definitely the logic that we're going down with. Yes. Yeah. Great. Are there any issues with with adherence when it comes to wearing things like this? Is that something that you are looking at or have been have have been questioning, have been studying at all? Yeah, adherence or patient compliance has been really good. Uh, again, so, you know, our in, at the Spark Biomedical side for treating addiction, we give patients a 28-day kit uh, so they can wear the device for up to a month. 
Uh, and we've had really good compliance with that. Uh, patients seem to be uh, getting enough of treatment or enough treatment that they need within that one month or for that, again, for that specific indication. Um, and we're not having any complaints of, you know, neurostimulation adverse events. Uh, and so, again, the literature points really good in the direction of the safety of this type of technology. Um, now, it's just our job to prove that it's efficacious. <laughs> and it, do you have any issues with people using it the way they're meant to? So, for example, if I had it and I was instructed to use it at a certain frequency or for a certain duration, I mean, how how well do people actually follow that, or do they do they maybe use it more if they feel like they need it more? And, and does that matter? Is that okay? Can you overdo it? Yeah, great questions again. Uh, in terms of the compliance, it's been very good, uh, specifically for this patient population. As we move into requiring only thirty minutes of stimulation a day, uh, history has shown with other types of diseases that require that type of treatment paradigm, patients comply very well to it. Uh, so it's not too demanding for them. Uh, and then regarding overdoing it, uh, you know, dosing studies are obviously needed. But again, I always kind of point my finger towards vagus nerve stimulation that started in epilepsy. These patients received a device and it's on every for 30 seconds, every five minutes uh, for years, if not the rest of their life. Um, and there have and the safety studies that have been coming out now decades worth of safety data are very favorable. Uh, and so uh, we don't see long term adverse issues with chronic stimulation regarding the vagus nerve. Right. A, a practical question. Is this something um, as it's currently being used and, and maybe as you foresee it being used with bleeding disorders indications? Is it something that requires a prescription? And is, is it something that. Um, how will doctors learn about this? Because I, I assume that for patients to have access, doctors will need to know about it. Yeah, being an FDA cleared device, uh, it will require a prescription. Um, and so once we uh, once that occurs, then that will be a commercial product. And so we'll, we will then begin our commercial um, launch of that product, which will be involving, again, if it's patients at home treating themselves, then it will be training the physicians that are taking care of these patients, uh, making them aware of the technology uh, so that they can educate their patient as this is a, a potential treatment option for them. And I have to say, as a biochemistry geek myself, I think this is so cool and so interesting. Um, bringing it to you know the patient population as a whole is, is a different kind of an education, right? I mean, a lot of our people with bleeding disorders are very familiar with how their bleeding disorders work. How, how would you make this sort of information about nerve stimulation and how that ties into treating a bleeding disorder? How do you bring that in an accessible form to this population, to this community? Chris, you want that one? <laughs> um, no, I think, um, so, so it, it's, I think time will tell um, since we are still early, we are not uh, FDA cleared at this point. So we're not marketing that way. Um, so time will tell for sure. Uh, but I think the straw man or the, the starting point will be really approaching those physicians, right? Getting in front of physicians and getting them to understand that this is a solution that can be, uh, you know, brought to this population. Um, and we're beginning that with, uh, you know, debuting it and discussing it at uh, typical uh, medical conferences like the International Society for Thrombosis and Hemostasis, uh, as one example, or the uh, American Academy of, uh, no, wait, American Society of Hemostasis, uh, or hematology, sorry, <laughs> I knew I'd get it. Um, so we'll begin with those methods, um, and then we'll broaden uh, the funnel as is appropriate, you know, pending FDA clearance. Yeah, well, that makes sense. And I suppose the other the other way I would be remiss if I didn't sort of recommend on on behalf of NBDF that you know talking to the community is a great way to find out how to talk to the community. They uh, they're a very informed community and they're also very good at at providing feedback on how how best to communicate something. So they're they're a fantastic resource themselves. Absolutely. So another question that's come in from our audience asking uh, um, whether this is a device that is implanted via neurosurgery. No, no, these, this is a wearable device. Uh, so uh, I think some of their, 
that that individual may be thinking of a vagus nerve stimulation device, which is an implant uh, where they put a, essentially a pulse generator in your chest, but it'll lead to the vagus nerve with a cuff electrode. Uh, this type of technology that we've been talking about today is considered, it's called wearable neurostimulation. So not an implant, uh, it, sits, it sits on the ear uh, and delivers stimulation through your skin. Okay, so really an, an external thing and, and removable, right? I mean, you could be something that you're wearing one day and not the other. That's right. Yep. Cool. Well, I, again, as the as a, a geek here, I love all the wearable technology as well. So I think that's super cool. <laughs> um, I think those are all of the questions that we have for you, gentlemen, about the technology and, and the research. I did want to ask Terry a question um, about the Pathway to Cures program and if somebody maybe is aware of some other innovative, interesting research that they think might be appropriate for Pathway to Cures. Is there a way to get in touch with you? Is there a way to sort of let you know about that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, please do get in touch with, with me if you come across an opportunity you think we should look at. We have a process of trying to meet, at least virtually, with every company that's introduced to us and then have a process to review and prioritize opportunities um, as far as fit with mission of the National Bleeding Disorders Foundation. We've looked at about um, over 140 opportunities since we launched the program a little over a year ago and have made two investments. We have a very active and engaged scientific advisory group who help us vet opportunities. And then also the ones that make it through the science and clinical review um, are referred with a full investment case to our investment committee of experienced investors. But you know, long story short, we want to talk to you. Um, we're really happy for introductions to opportunities. Uh, we learned about five leaders before five leaders was out of stealth mode, which was really helpful. And that was through our network of people who were familiar with their work and what was going on at Feinstein and so forth. So, you know, if there's something you think we ought to know, there are all introductions are good introductions. And I will put my um email address in the chat. Great, sounds good. And maybe while you do that, I'll ask a question I've been curious about. Um, five liters, why five liters? What What is five liters? It's just, a, it's a fun way of saying that humans on average have five liters of blood in them. And we're trying to keep every drop in there. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Well, thank you very much, Terry and Dr. Zora and Godoparest for answering all of those questions. I'd like to thank Terry Willey of Pathway to Cures and Dr. Zora and Godaparest of Spark Biomedical and Five Leaders for sharing your expertise and your time with us this afternoon. I'd like to thank each of you in our audience for joining us. This recorded webinar will be available at hemophilia.org shortly after the webinar. You can go to the NBDF website and under the events tab, if you select past events, you'll find all of our archived webinars there. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon and have an excellent week. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Naveen. Thank you, Fiona. My pleasure. Thank you.